Good evening, everyone. So I'm Minnie Rowe, and uh, I'm very delighted to have you all here for our fireside chat. Great with uh, Jihoon Rim. As uh, Tom just mentioned, he was the executive advisor and the former CEO of Kakao from 2015 to 2018. His appointment at 34 years old made him the youngest CEO among all of Korea's top 500 companies, so quite a feat. Uh, during his tenure, Kakao grew to one of the best, or actually the best mobile platform in Korea, expanding, as Tom had said, into finance, content, mobility, and artificial intelligence, and delivering services that is highly praised by all of its users. He's now living in New York, and hot off the presses, he was just named as the executive in residence at NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor teaching a course called Managing a High-Tech Company, the CEO Perspective, of which he knows a lot about. <laughs> um, so judging by our audience, it looks like many of you probably are very familiar with Kakao Talk to communicate with your friends here. Um, and um, so, oh, sorry, excuse me. My K-Talk keeps on going. Oh, goodness. All right. That's the you part know of Kakao yes. Talk. This will be a good time to remind all of you to silence your phones, please. No more cacao talk for the rest of our time here. That includes you, June. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's get going. Mm -hmm. Let's start from the beginning. Um, so what I just mentioned, uh, in the U.S., mm -hmm. I think that most of us know Kakao just for our Messenger app, that cute little sound that you just heard. Uh, but Kakao is so much more than just that Messenger app in Korea. Sure. Can you explain to us the breadth of Kakao in Korea and how much of that you were responsible for in, in your tenure? Okay. Um, I think I have to ask the audience, like, how many of you have the Korean version of Kakao Talk? Okay, like one third. So for those who don't have the Korean version, I think I have to explain it a little bit more. It's not just the messenger. Um, I'll bring up some numbers. So uh, Kakao is a big tech company uh, valued around 10 billion US dollars, have uh, more than 5,000 employees. And um, Korean population is 50 million for, for information. And um, Kakao's active user is 40 million. So basically, if you you know take off the babies who don't have a smartphone, basically everybody's um, using Kakao Talk, and not only that, uh, we have a search engine number two search engine called Down, so it's gonna be like an equivalent of Bing. I can't say I wish it would be Google, but it's like Bing, and also um, I'm not sure how many of you used Melon. Uh, Melon is the number one music streaming service in in South Korea. Um, we have five million paying users. Uh, monthly paying like eight dollars a month so it's going to be like you know having a spotify in in korea and if you have visited uh south korea we also have cacao taxi so that's going to be like the uber uh, and monthly active user is more than 10 million so what else do we have cacao bank as tom just introduced we launched this service in 2017 and within two years 10 million users opened their bank account uh with cacao bank and what is alarming is that uh, this bank, you know, doesn't have a single physical branch. So that's the beauty of digital platform. And I could go on for 30 minutes, but I'll quit uh, because this is not a place to, you know, uh, sell cacao. But if you think about it, you know, it's like it's like uh, Facebook plus uh, Venmo Uber plus Eats Uber for, plus yeah. um, even Uber Eats. We have food delivery right. too. Um, but I so. think what probably sets cacao apart from that is that these are all search engines and and services but cacao owns mm -hmm. uh, cacao taxi cacao bank Correct. Cacao. so that's uh, can you explain a little bit about that and and why that is um uh, revolutionary mm. in a way so Owning it doesn't really make it revolutionary, but um, because we had the messenger, and as I said, uh, we are capturing 40 million out of 50 million, um, I believe that we were the perfect platform to connect all the required service that will help your life. And we thought of that um, we could deep dive into all the industries and verticals that makes you know your life better. Some of them, for example, Cacao Taxi, we directly developed it. Cacao Bank, we directly developed it. But for example, food delivery, we partnered with a bunch of 
uh, business partners. For example, you can order pizza, Burger King, um, any kind of you know franchise foods, including um, chicken. Um, you know, it's in Korea you always do that. Uh, chimek. And you know th- those kind of things, uh, we didn't do it by ourselves. We have a bunch of third parties uh, who are collaborating with us, so it's really case by case. But um, if I just try to explain like what cacao is in in South Korea, basically it's a messenger. But because we have all the users, um, we are connecting our users to their required uh, something that they want to do. So basically, it's going to be their service or businesses. That they want to do so this messenger actually could be viewed as a small internet itself mm-hmm. so when you came on board in 2015 mm-hmm. how much of those were already in place mm-hmm. and how much did you uh, mm-hmm. yourself put into place okay um first i think i have to say that it was not me who developed the cacao talk or these services it's our team so you know all the accomplishments that um we made all the praises that i got is thanks to my colleagues who really worked on that project. Because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the CEO is the person who sets the direction, uh, allocates the resources, and then enables the team to work on, you know, removing the obstacles. That's the role of the CEO. It's not defining the functions of a, a, a service. It's making things happen. So um, actually, all of those um, were done by my uh, wonderful colleagues. But when I became the CEO, it was the early stage. So um, Cacao Taxi just started in 2015. That was not my job. But still, you know, a lot of, you know, putting a lot of effort in content, Cacao Games and Cacao Pages, which is a manga service. And also, um, we acquired Melon in early 2016. So, yeah, that was a big bet because it was valued around $1.8 billion. It was like one of the largest acquisition in Korean internet tech um, history. $1.8 billion. Um, What else? AI, um, Kakao Bank, um, food delivery, movie ticket uh, reservation, hospital reservation. um, You name all the things. Yeah, that was under... um, yeah, when I was the CEO. Right, and mm-hmm. spoken like a true CEO, he doesn't take any credit for, <laughs> which is good. Um, can we talk a little bit, though, let's take a step back for a second and talk a little bit about how you got to um, Cacao mm-hmm. and, um, and become the CEO. You, you have a very varied background, mm-hmm. varied background, sorry. Uh, you have um, experience in technology, consulting, entrepreneurism, engineering. You have a degree from KAIST, which mm-hmm. we all know is the preeminent, for those of you who don't know here, uh, is a preeminent scientific institution in Korea. Um, so how did all of that come into play? Uh, how did you utilize that mm-hmm. uh, in your role as a CEO of Kakao? I have to say that it ended up being very useful, but honestly speaking, in the beginning, I didn't know that it would turn out like this, right? And if I start from KAIST, that's because you said that it was a prominent school, which it is, um, actually, that was the time when I realized that I'm not that smart. Because <laughs> I thought, when I was in middle school and high school, I thought I was very smart. But after going to KAIST, I realized that I'm not the smartest uh, among the students. And um, that was the reason that actually I kind of changed my dream from becoming a scientist or engineer uh, to like a business person. So I was majoring in computer science. And then from my junior year, um, I changed to industrial engineering, which is a little bit more close to uh, business. Um, but it was a great experience because it made me humble. Um, seriously, uh, there were so many smart people, uh, much smarter than I am. And that was a good experience. Um, every time I lead, um, that reminded me, that made me, you know, bring in the best people who are smarter than I am. So that was a great experience. And then I have to talk a little bit of consulting. Um, you know, all, all my experiences um, were not planned ahead. It just kind of happened. Um, and I didn't really have a, a grand plan, honestly speaking. Um, when it comes to Boston Consulting Group, I just thought that it was a nice, it would be nice to go to like McKinsey, BCG, or Bain, uh, if I get into one of those three, I'll just go because at that time, you know, it was a cool thing to do. So I just got the offer and went, and then I realized that this is not the thing that I would like to do. Um, so I quit within 10 months. After 10 months, I just quit. And then um, venture capital, I've been a venture capitalist for 10 years, but the irony is that when I was at college, 
I didn't even know uh, the term venture capitalist. So I didn't even know there was like a vocation uh, called venture capitalist. After quitting Boston Consulting Group, you know, one of my friends kind of told me about this um, position and then I met some people um, and then suddenly I got hired. <laughs> and then that turned out to be, you know, my thing because if you really think about venture capital, it's that meeting a lot of people, which I love, and then it's dealing about tech, which I love. So basically it was doing my hobby and then I'm getting paid. So that's the reason I think that I was able to do okay. Um, actually, I was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was pretty good. And yeah, that was how I kind of became um, successful and famous. And in 2012, as you know, um, I found in my own venture capital. And then it kind of turned out to be well. And all of a sudden in 2015, the board of Kakao um, approached me and asked if I could become the CEO of Kakao. And becoming a CEO of Kakao was never on my plan. Because, you know, if you think about it, I built a venture capital. I was the founder and CEO. It was doing very well. There's no, there was no reason for me to do something else, right? So I thought I would become a venture capitalist for 20 years, 30 years, but um, I got the offer and then I thought about it. And then again, I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to you know, wow. do something new. There's never a straight path. No. To, yeah. even, we'll even here, you know, like... Um, <laughs> I just came to New York. It's not that I got an offer from NYU Stern and came to New York. I came to New York and I was, you know, having fun spending time. And, you know, some people uh, kind of introduced me to a lot of people. And then a professor um, at NYU Stern uh, met me and he, he kind of really liked me. And then he strongly pushed me to teach a course. And that's how I got involved at NYU Stern from this spring semester. And kind of, you know, the school liked me again. And then I expanded my role as an executive in residence from this September. So I'm spending more time um, at right. school. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the whole networking aspect and the importance of broadening your horizons and, and you never know where your opportunities are going to come from. Um, but let's switch back again to uh, Kakao, mm -hmm. finish out the Kakao part. So um, tell me a little bit about why you decided to focus on um content mm -hmm. and uh, artificial intelligence and also you know here in america we don't know any of that so um you had mentioned that you uh in private you had mentioned that you focused more on korea because you mm -hmm. wanted to um, build cacao in korea tell me a little bit tell us a little bit about that okay so um when i became the ceo in 2015 cacao was operating like more than 50 services and I thought that we kind of had to concentrate and focus. So there were some things that I focused, like I, I could say like three. One is cacao talk. You might think that it's so obvious that we focus on cacao, but it was not. Um, you know, they, we were doing so many things. So I, I told my team, my whole company, my, my colleagues that we should really focus on cacao because I really believed in uh, the messenger, that this is not just a communication tool. It's a platform that, as I said, could connect users to what they want, right? So um, I really focused on Kakao Talk, but even within the Kakao Talk project, um, we were doing a lot of overseas, you know, um, business with Kakao, and we wanted to become at that time before I came in. Um, the team members really wanted to make this a global service, but it was a huge controversy. But I killed all the overseas um, projects because. It was a huge controversy. It was an easy decision. But uh, I believe that at that time already, in each country, we had a dominant messenger. So for if you go to Indonesia, you have WeChat. Uh, here, we have WhatsApp. Uh, all across the world, we have you know Facebook Messenger. So it's going to be a very uphill battle. And there's no reason for foreigners to use Kakao Talk in overseas. So I killed all the projects. Um, and I really focused on Kakao Talk, that's one thing. And I really focused on content, which was, again, very controversial because uh, basically Kakao is a tech company. And a lot of people were saying that content business is different. Um, it's a little bit, it has a lot of more fluctuation and it's a little bit hard to predict. But I was telling them, and I had a feeling that, you know, if you really want to go to global, it, it's going to be difficult to go with uh, uh, utility a messenger but korea is very good in content you have to go 
some with something that you're very good at. your home country is very strong so if you think about it it's k-pop you know k-dramas and beauty and game and you know um manga comics so that's the reason we hugely invested we created funds invested in a lot of um um developers and individual artists um and cacao game was kind of turned out to become pretty successful around the globe uh, also cacao page which is serving a mobile manga service comic book service um became a huge success in korea and also in japan um And Melon was also the same uh, logic. You know, we're investing hugely in content. This could be the global thing, not the messenger. And the last part, as you said, is AI. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, like when it comes to AI, um, we always think that AI is some some um, monster that it's going to kill us and <laughs> take off all our jobs. But from my perspective, it was two things. One is that um, all our service could be better by facilitated by AI. So if you think about it, it's, you know, content recommendation, um, ad matching systems, like taxi matching systems, all can be much better by AI. So that was one important thing. And the second part is that, as I said, um, I thought, I believe that a cacao talk is like a platform connecting users to a lot of business partners. And if you think about um, a lot of businesses can't really build their own AI because building AI technologies Honestly, it's not very easy. We have very limited talented in Korea, not only in Korea, around the globe. And those people, those engineers, those researchers want to work with top tier. So um, we were able to hire, a, we had more than 1,000 engineers. So we were able to, you know, build that AI technology and make it as a platform. When I say AI, you know, it could be like the voice interface interactions that you could see from Amazon Echo, the image recognitions. content recommendations, all those things, make it as a module and then provide it to our partners because they cannot develop by themselves. And if, if we provide that as, as, a, uh, as a module, actually, they get locked into our system. So that's the way to lock in our partners. Um, that, that's what I thought. So, um, yeah. A lot of this is going over my head. <laughs> the rest of you, this whole tech, it's very fascinating, but I don't understand the whole, all, all of the modules and AI. Okay. <laughs> but it's, uh, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Messenger app for just a second. So mm -hmm. Messenger apps are integral to the to making all the other parts work it wouldn't work without the messenger mm -hmm. app is what mm -hmm. you're saying mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so how uh why do you think that these messenger apps is do you think that sorry do you think the messenger apps are going to be integral to how we conduct our lives more and more in the future is this sort of this is just the tip of the iceberg i think yeah i do so um especially in the east mm -hmm. you know like korea china japan We have Kakao Talk, WeChat, and Line. So you, you, you'll see much more advanced features over there. But even in the US, I believe that uh, Messenger will evolve. And actually, I believe that Facebook is moving into that direction. So um, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and uh, Instagram DM, it's going to be kind of integrated, I believe. And you'll see a lot of much more uh, interaction, not only with your friends, but it will enable you to interact with uh, business partners, service partners, I believe. That's the way how Facebook is going. Um, and if you really think about it, it's because, um, I'm going to ask you a question, like, when was the last time that you downloaded a mobile app? I think not, you know, after you change your phone and then you have to reinstall Gmail or Facebook. If you really think about it, um, you it's going to be a long time uh, since you... downloaded a really new app and then you're continuing keep continuing using it um, the stats tells that right so now for a lot of business partners services um, it's very difficult to reach out to customers and messenger could be like a perfect platform for those partners to reach customers then sometimes th this is what's happening in in cacao and also wechat you don't even have to download an app You could just go through the messenger and use that service because if you really think about it, you don't use those services that often. So again, I believe that a lot of those could be very well incorporated in a messenger. And I believe that you're going to see that in, in the States too. 
do you have an idea? And I'm not going to mm -hmm. hold you. No one's going to hold you to this. But how long, how soon do you think something like that? Uh, how far in the future is that? Is it? Are we talking next year? Five years? The evolution of Messenger. One, two years, one years, I think. Mm -hmm. Like Facebook is pushing that way, so uh, you'll see it soon, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Something to look forward to. <laughs> um, and then these advances that are happening in America and also in the East that are already mm -hmm. happening. Um, I know that it's hard to take credit for anything or, or even know how much, but in your opinion, just your own opinion, how much do you think Cacao influenced them and their business models? Mm. I have to say, um, okay, I, I was a CEO from 2015, and Kakao was launched in 2010, March. So there were a lot of great things that was already developed and successful before I joined. For example, um, we were the first messenger who brought in mobile games into a messenger, incorporated it uh, into a messenger in 2011, Emoji. Uh, was one of the first thing that we did. And then a lot of messengers kind of copied us. And what, what we're proud about emojis, for example, is that um, the quality is much better, of course. You see ours and you see like others, right? Um, it's different. And the reason why it's different is because we didn't develop and we didn't create the emojis. We made an ecosystem. So basically, the people, the artists, the designers, uh, individuals are kind of creating that emoji and selling it to users. That's the reason you buy it for $2, right? And some successful um, designers um, earn like 1 million US dollars. Like one single person earned like $1 million by selling emojis. Um, it's a huge ecosystem. Those kind of things we're very proud of. Um, we were like the first uh, messenger that enabled commerce through messenger. So um, if you have the Korean version of Kakao Talk, um, you could send Starbucks out there to your friends, right? The coupon. And also, which is alarm, like astonishing, is that you could even send physical goods. And I think this was brilliant because the key, it was like tweaking the business process, is that the recipient, the receiver types in the address. So it's it doesn't you know feel creepy. I just send something to you. And then if you want to accept it, you accept it and you type in your address. So that tweak enabled a huge growth. So there were so many uh, innovative business you know, um, models uh, from the beginning. And then, as I said, Cacao Bank and many other, other things that um, yeah, we were praised within the industry. Um, yeah, I think yeah, we're pretty proud about what we've done. And nowadays, honestly, but you know, in the industry, uh, WeChat is doing great. Um, if, if, if there's anybody who's studying or you know, working in um, in internet or mobile or tech industry, take a look at Tencent and WeChat. You'll learn a lot. Uh, they're doing great. So what would be the one thing, or maybe three or five, that you are most proud of during your tenure? Mm -hmm. um, I think I have to say that... Um, I completed the mission um, because when I was appointed as the CEO of Cacao, actually at that time, it was in kind of a crisis mode. Uh, 2015, second quarter, the company was you know, facing decreasing in revenue and also uh, operating profit, which is very rare in internet space. Normally, you're expecting double-digit growth. And at that time, you know, the company was going down. Uh, that was the reason uh, the board decided to change the CEO and I jumped in. And during my term, um, again, you know, all the work was done by my colleagues and we made it. The revenue doubled, uh, the operating profit doubled, and the stock price almost doubled. So um, I can say that we kind of completed the mission that we were given. Um, that thing I have to say um, that I'm most proud of because if you're a CEO, you have to do your job. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're nice or how can I say, if you had good intentions, you have to be successful. If you don't grow your company, if you don't make your product successful, um, your employees will suffer. Think about it. Think about like you launched 10 services and every single thing fails. Think about the moral of that company. 
So if you're the CEO, the most important thing is that you have to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to say that that would be the proudest thing. Thanks to my colleagues, um, I was able to do that. And yeah, I might have some more, but let's see. Yeah, <laughs> If we have time, I can come up with that. Um, I think this also begs the question, what did you leave undone that mm -hmm. you wish that you could have done? Um, I'm not sure. I think I have to go back to the why I, I quit, you know, why I resigned is that I thought that I did my part because, as I said, from the crisis mode to kind of developing a platform, setting the direction and launching huge projects, that was my part. Mm -hmm. And it kind of turned out to be good. And from that part, from, from, from that situation, it's a little bit more of execution and implementations and, you know, growing 10 million users to 12 million users, some kind of those things. So um, I don't regret, you know, like that I couldn't finish something. I, I just felt that, you know, this is the part that um, I've done successfully and I'm happy to, you know, give my baton to my next right, yeah. cool you CEOs. In, you right, you I, saw, I you conquered, job. you left. <laughs> kind of. And you know, the co-CEOs that who is currently uh, leading the company, both of them are the people that I brought in. So, mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about KQ, mm -hmm. the um, venture capital business that you started in 2012. And I want to talk about it more in terms of the entrepreneurship, because mm -hmm. how many of you are entrepreneurs in this room? Can you raise hands? Anyone start have their own business? Can not a whole lot. Anyone interested in starting a business? Everybody's got a business, set, right? Okay, everyone wants to start a business. I want to start a business. Uh, I just don't know how. Don't. <laughs> oh, don't. Okay. Well, that begs my next question. Um, but um, I'm sure that you probably can relate to to a lot of us, right? I mean, business is business, mm -hmm. right? Um, tell me a little bit about what the biggest challenge is. Why do you say don't? What is the biggest challenge? It's about tough. Here? It's, it's much more tougher than you could imagine. And um, all the business plans never happens. I never saw a company that really follows the uh, business plan. That's one thing. Actually, the part that is even worse <laughs> is that um, dealing with people. It's always difficult, especially I can see most of you are pretty young. Um, when I started KQ Ventures, I was 31. And of course, again, I was the youngest um, venture capital CEO in Korea. I had a very difficult time recruiting people because those, you know, highly professional, very talented investment professionals didn't want to work for me because I'm less experienced. Um, it might look bad for them. So when I began, um, I had to start with some very talented young people who never had investment experiences. So um, that was pretty difficult. And once we kind of, you know, um, built our presence and became a little bit successful, from that time I was able to bring in um, senior people from the industry. Then you face another um, issue, which is you had your current loyal early employees or co-founders, and then they were very great but then you're bringing in some senior people who are a little bit more experienced and competent. And then you have this kind of conflict. This is very difficult to resolve. And it's not only me. I see this pattern in almost every successful startups. And it's most of the time, you, you never have like a right answer, but most of the time, uh, the more experienced and competent person has to take the role rather than you know the early um, member unless that person really grows fast so that you know transition is never easy and it's not a pleasant experience uh, so whenever you're doing a startup um, if you become successful you'll experience it so doing a startup itself you really think about it um, the things doesn't really happen as you expected you always deal with people and if you're a CEO or founder you have to make tough decisions um, do you think firing a person will be pleasant? It's never. It's <laughs> never a pleasant experience, but sometimes you have to do it. So, um, But I think right. also because you're kind of scaring us off of uh -huh. <laughs> doing any businesses, I think. Um, I think it's kind of uh, 
like how you've lived your life up to now. Uh-huh. Everything you don't have a grand plan, right? You just right. kind of go in and and figure it out. Is that kind of what you're supposed to do? Just sort of don't right. have too many plans, right? Right. But you have to have a a a, a compass, right? I mean, a focus. Okay, I I might have been scaring you off a little <laughs> bit. Um, I did that intentional because you know, if you really want to do a startup, even though I say this, you have to be willing to do it. That could be like a a, 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 a way to test, maybe. And um, as you just said, uh, if you ha- you have to have a thing, why are you doing this? Because now I see so many people who think startup is a cool thing to do. Everybody's doing a startup. You feel like you're gonna become like a billionaire, which 99.9% doesn't happen. So I just want to challenge like, what's the real reason you're doing this? And who are your team? Because there's a very high chance that if even though you had a right team, um, the team will break. Because if you have talented people, uh, they will have other options. Let's say the business didn't go as planned. Three months is okay, six months is okay. A year, you get some doubts. Wait, what are we doing? You know, I have an offer from Google. Why am I doing? Well, why am I working here? Then someone might leave, right? So these kind of interactions and experiences that you have to go through, it's never easy. So I, that's the reason I'm challenging you. If you really want to do a startup, you, you you really have to have the reason why you're doing this that sticks you together as a team. Is there a sweet spot where you kind of say? You know, because all of us, we don't want to ever say, oh, I, I failed. Or mm. maybe you failed too, or maybe you might pull out too early. Like, mm. is there a time, what is it as an entrepreneur, where can you say, all right, I got to stick it through, or I got to pull out? Like, do you, can you explain a little bit about that process that... I think you know it. If you're an entrepreneur, right, um, you could fake others and you can deceive others, but you can't fake yourself. So if you're really into, do you really believe that this will be a success or are you kind of, you know, faking it? Um, that's the time. That's like one thing that you have to decide um, whether you're going to stick it to it or not. And um, are you doing this just for the sake of doing a startup or do you really think there's a problem that you really think that you have to solve? Mm-hmm. Most of the times, the way I define a company is that a company is an entity that solves a problem. Every company is solving a problem, right? So if you're really into the problem rather than the solution, maybe the first solution didn't work out. It's okay. You could do the second one, the third one. But let's say that you have a team and you just went for like idea A, it didn't turn out. You go to idea B, idea C, D, and then every time you're doing different things and Every time you fail, I'm not sure if you're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So it's like the passion for the actual um, problem. The maybe? problem, right? Is so you have to have a, a clear idea of what it is that you need to do, and not just uh-huh. doing it for the sake of doing it. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, they also say, obviously, that being in the right place at the mm-hmm. right time mm-hmm. um, is obviously very important as well. But mm-hmm. if you don't know somebody the right person to tell you when the right time or right place is Mm -hmm. and opportunity can also Mm -hmm. pass you by right Mm -hmm. so that kind of segues into our um talk about networking Mm -hmm. and how important uh networking is now we all know right you know you have to go to these events see you guys are here you're going to network later right you're going to network with chiun um we give out the business cards. We do, you know, we talk to people. We shake hands. We press the flesh. We go back home. We email, and then crickets. Nobody, nobody emails us back. And it's really, it's, it's demoralizing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Um, I speak not from personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how do you? Uh, let's let's talk first about like how much of your where you are now is due to mm-hmm. your extreme talented networking um i would like to put it this way um there was a huge luck part in my career um and i'm not saying that luck is more important than being capable and competent but 
there are so many people who are competent, right? Who are capable. So out of those people, how you stand out could be luck, driven by luck. And most of the luck actually comes from people. So um, I have to admit that networking or you know having the right people connection is important. But if I really think back, I never really went to like network sessions. Um, it it could be good. I cannot say that that's bad. But um, if your experience, I think it really depends. If you have something to sell, right? If you're capable, if you have, if if you're competent. And when you go there and you have something to sell, so it, it kind of you know turns out well. You get to know new people. If it's if it's that's what you're experiencing, maybe it's it could be okay. But if it's just you know, even though you don't have your own, if you haven't built your own competencies, if you just go to the networking event, I think you'll get almost nothing because if you have to be on the other person's shoe, um, if you think about those those people that you want to connect. Um, all of them, most of the people will always, you know, contact him or her. And then, what's your selling point? What's why do why do I have to talk to you? They're all busy people, right? So if you don't have that, um, maybe it would be a little bit better to for you to focus on yourself first and try to build some, you know, capabilities and competencies before just trying to go to random networking events. Um, so I think, yeah, you, you need both, right? Some, some, some weak ties up to some level going to network events. I'm not saying that this is not important, but just going this doesn't make anything, right? You have to strengthen your competencies. What's your selling point? After meeting somebody and in 30 seconds, I think like, oh yeah, I met Ji Hoon. He's kind of this person, right? You have to have that kind of selling point and... Um, if you have not made it yet, uh, look at it and try to put your strength in front of it rather than, you know, cover your weakness. Um, that's always the best way, I believe. Right. They tell, we talk a lot about the elevator pitch, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, um, if you met somebody in the elevator, how are you going to wow them in 30 seconds or less? But if somebody who everybody here wants to network with, um, just coming up to you and saying, hi, Tune, I, I really admire you, and uh, I want to get into business, but um, I just wanted to meet you. That's not enough. You're say, that's, I don't think so. That won't make you remember me. Not really, not really. What will because make there, you there remember me? There are so many other people who say the same thing, yeah. right? So tell me what will make you remember me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, then I have to be responsible. Um, but so if you really think about it, you the typical thing that you say m might not be that unique. Like, you know, I go to this school, yeah. right? I go to NYU Stern. That's where I teach. So NYU Stern, Columbia, like whatever school you're uh, um, um, studying. And then I do this kind of work. That's that's a good start. But so it's going to be like, what? What what's what is my strength? Or if you can't do that, or or other things could be like you know I really looked into you, mm -hmm. so I kind of know what you're doing. I think I can help you, um, whatever it is, right? So I might be the right person to help you out. Oh. Uh, that could be like well, wait, this person kind of you know really looked into me, and um, he or she really knows me, right? And he or she is willing to kind of volunteer or work um, for me. Uh, that could be slightly different. Doing your research right. into but, the person. Right. But again, it's, you know, bringing something to the table. You can't just right. say and come there, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Ji Hoon. Um, I admire you. Uh, could you please? Can I pick your brain? I mean, that's right. a big thing that everyone says, right? Mm -hmm. Can we have coffee and can I pick right. your brain? But pick right. your brain about what? So you have to have a something that you want to mm -hmm. emphasize. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, I think at this point, maybe we could open it up to some questions because we've gone through a lot of different topics. We've talked about entrepreneurship and networking and cacao. So this is your opportunity now to um, ask you anything you want. <laughs> Just kidding. Within reason. Um, is there a mic, uh, Esther, that we're going to be? Okay, so there's a think, mic that's yeah, been going to be going some. around. So just raise your hand and uh, we'll try and uh, there's... 
And if you could stand up uh, so we can see you, that would be great too. Hi, I'm Jessica. Thanks for coming out today. Um, I know you mentioned that CEOs, like, they need to grow. Um, for tech companies, um, creativity is huge. So where do you get your creativity? Um, creativity might not be the right word that you want to pursue because I'm a little bit against to that word because it kind of feels that you have to have it from the beginning. Whereas um, leading a company, being successful, whatever you're doing, um, doesn't really have to be given. And it does, sometimes it doesn't really have to do something with creativity. If you're really into the problem again, um, and if you really think it 24-7, you'll see some solutions out of the box. And it doesn't only have to be you. You could talk to a lot of people and it can use a lot of brains, right? And if you kind of integrated that and come up with an integrated solution, that could result into a creativity, creative solution. Um, the reason I was saying that, you know, I don't really like that word is because it, it's just like, it feels me like it's a talent, right? There are some creative people, mm -hmm. there are some non-creative people. So these people are, you know, gifted. Um, I don't think that to become a successful manager, executive, or CEO, you have to be extremely uh, creative. I don't think so. I'm not speaking for designers or, 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 or those people. Uh, that's a different um, area. I don't know very well, but becoming a leader, I don't think that that's a must to have. Um, I, I actually don't see the mic. Oh, uh, okay. Hello. Um, hi. This is kind of a specific question. I don't know, you might have the answer to that, but you compared Kakao Talk to Facebook in America in its reach and it's really focused on Messenger app. Uh -huh. And currently, Facebook and other big tech companies in America are facing a lot of antitrust scrutiny from the uh -huh. government. Do you foresee similar problems for Kakao Talk in Korea that has its feet in so many different pools? And if so, how do you see that playing out in Korea, Asia for other big tech companies as well? Um, I think it's going to be, it's, it's happening all around the world, not only the States, Europe, um, Korea, even I believe it's going to happen in China because we are, you know, our life is supported by a lot of tech companies and it's kind of indispensable. But it goes back to the core question, um, is a dominant company a bad thing? So that's a huge debate that we're having in, in the States. And actually, that's the same debate that we have in South Korea, too. Um, is breaking up a company a better solution? Um, what's the real consumer harm? Actually, if you, have to, if you want to define uh, the harm of a monopoly, you have to come up with what's really harming uh, to the consumers, right? Um, but it's a little bit difficult to define if you really think about it. So we're going to have a lot of debate but rather than focusing on that the the part that i'm a little bit more interesting is about you know um, um having a good platform especially when it comes to for example ai news fake news those kind of parts i think we can work out and tech companies should be willing to work with you know um um, governments and not just say that we're just a platform hands off. Mm -hmm. um, I never unloaded anything. It's all the users. I don't have to, you know, check whether this is legit or not. Thanks to the technology and AI, you know, um, we can find patterns and, you know, look at the source and there are many things that we can do. So um, making this whole technology space and internet space more safe, um, I think that's a good conversation to have all the data that uh, technology companies are having, um, I think those are legit points. So um, tech companies should be more responsible. Uh, those are good discussions, I think. When it comes to monopoly, uh, those are like the econ economist's area. But for me, I, I'm not sure. You, know, you have to define the consumer harm, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, hi, Jihoon, this is Era. Um, so continue on that topic about like technology, like as a tech investor, like I wonder what's your thoughts on next wave of digital trends? Because this year we start to see Kakao enter like cryptocurrency, blockchain space, ground X project, Clayton. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder as an advisor to the company right now, do you think 
that's the right direction to go, or is there other alternative you think the company should pursue? Mm-hmm. I feel like one of the reasons that we're trying to find like the next big thing is partly due to the media that we kind of have the pressure that we have to define something. So, but if you really think about it, almost every year or almost every other year, we come up with some keyword, right? Like curation is like the next big subscription commerce is the next big thing. Um, sharing economy is the next thing. Um, AI is the next big thing. Now, from 2017, I think, um, crypto is the next big thing. Um, I don't like that approach. Um, if you really think about it, again, all the companies are solving some problems of a customer, of a user, and those things are kind of a tool. Those are tools that advances the solution. So there's no reason for a tech company to, you know, have their own curation system, extensively apply AI, um, also have a crypto uh, platform and make all the platforms connected and, you know, generate some point system and everything. So it's not like the next big thing is AI. Think about like, what's the AI service? Well, if you really think about it, AI is not a service. AI is the core technology. It, it should be like a utility, like an infrastructure. It's like an internet. Mm-hmm. I would rather say that AI is the next internet. Mm-hmm. That makes sense for me. But, um, you know, picking up the words and saying that this is like the next big thing, um, I don't agree and I don't like that approach. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, you pick. <laughs> There's a lot. When you're operating venture uh, venture capital, did you have, have any investment discipline? And also, it would be really great if you could share a couple uh, key life learning lessons that you could share mm-hmm. with us. That would be really great. Thank you. First, when it comes to venture capital, and especially if you're investing early stage, you have to admit that it's very difficult to predict the success of a company. Um you might think that you know which one will succeed, but honestly speaking, I didn't know. So it's placing a lot of bets to the most plausible ones. And even though we do that, out of 10 companies, five totally fail. So they just go out of business. Like two, three become okay. And the real home runs are like one or two. So that's the nature of venture capital, especially if you're investing early stage. So, um, and again, going back to the uh, talk that I uh, I mentioned, like how difficult doing a startup is, um, I never tried to invest uh, by just seeing a presentation because you could deliver a perfect presentation, like 30 minute presentation. If you think about it, how many times do you think that entrepreneur practiced that? I'm pretty sure that they even prepared a joke, like when to, you know, place a joke. (laughs) So the way I liked it is um, I wanted to sit down with the CEO or the founding members and just talk for three hours. Like, why are you doing this? Like, really? And then then sometimes, you know, entrepreneurs come up with a story that you know they were resonating with this problem from when they were students high school students and then i ask another question and another question i dig down and then it turns out to be false Mm -hmm. sometimes the 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 story of the co-founders doesn't align so those were the ways that actually um i could feel if they were really into this problem that was one thing and I kind of liked, you know, um, eccentric people rather than just smart people because going through this startup process, um, it's pretty difficult. So I even, with the Korean media, um, um, I said that, you know, I really like Torai. Uh, all the Torai, yeah, I invest in Torai there, right? So, <laughs> so um, yeah, sorry for uh, non-Korean speakers, but yeah. Um, uh, I'm not even quite sure how to... Yeah, it. <laughs> I don't know how to translate that, but yeah, like uh, those, the, uh, the out there, like the no, uh, it's the unorthodox, a, a little maybe bit crazy, unique, yeah. um, eccentric, whatever. So, so yeah, you, you get the idea, right? 
So Others? the people who have passion. But passion, passion again is a word that uh, I don't love <laughs> <laughs> because if you really think about it, I'm not a negative person. I'm seeing a lot of things that I don't like, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not a negative person. Uh, don't get me wrong. Because you know, passion is something that if you really think about it, there were so many things that you are passionate, but it cools down too, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like you really love to do something, and like six months later, it cools down. So rather than saying that it's a passion. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, are you really into that problem? Um, what's the real reason you have to do that? Mm -hmm. um, it's slightly different from passion, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Yeah. In the middle? Anywhere? Hi, I'm a student at Columbia studying data science. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, you've been an entrepreneur, a founder, a CEO, um, now even a professor, and you're still yet so young. And I'm curious where you want to head to at this point and what your life goals are. Thank you. I don't really know. Uh, what should I do? Uh, <laughs> I am kind of. But, but, but the thing is, like, you know, um, this unpredictability, I kind of enjoy it. Um, at, when I was quitting um, Cacao, I never thought that I would live in New York, as I said. Uh, I just came here, you know, to have fun. And all of a sudden... I'm teaching at NYU Stern, so um, I don't really know what I'll do, but every time, um, if you think about it, I, became a, I was working on Naver, a uh, tech company, and then became a consultant, a venture capitalist, and running a huge, uh, big company, and, and teaching now. I think these kind of change keeps me more engaged and focused, actually, and if I was doing the same job for like 10 years, 20 years, I think I'm pretty sure that I, I would lose the passion, right? <laughs> so, so, and one beauty of living in New York, um, it's my first time living in the States. So I just wanted to live here, right? I, I just wanted to learn how, um, you know, things happen here, how things operate, because there are so many great things in the US. So I'm learning so many things. It's fun, um, new things, new challenges. Um, even though I was, a pretty famous CEO in South Korea. Here, a lot of people say that, South Korea? Really? <laughs> yeah, still, I have to admit, right? So, but those challenges I enjoy because I, can, I have an opportunity to prove them wrong, right? So it, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Andrew, and um, you have specifically mentioned about the Indonesia's new launching service. And um, last month, I happened to had a chance to talk with the Alex Kim, who was the CEO of Indonesia Kakao Talk. Mm -hmm. I, I've talked to him for an, for an hour, and then um, what have specifically happened launching the new service in Indonesia, and how, what do you think about his new business, Dunamus Blockchain? And Which those... one are you talking about? Huh? Which one are you talking about um, in Indonesia? Uh, because Kakao is doing uh, yeah, things. The, are you talking like, about the blockchain thing? Yeah, blockchain, the Dunamu. And he's currently working at the Dunamu, and he was a former right. Indonesia CEO, Kakao Talk. and then. But I think, you know, I can't speak for Dunamu, right? He, he, okay. He's currently working at Dunamu, right? Yeah. So, um, so then I don't maybe think then, that I'll, I'm the right person to speak uh, for. Okay, then can you, then, can you just like speak specifically talk about the Indonesia service in Kakao? I'm not sure that that's really his um, um, right. You know, uh, I'm like, not yeah. the CEO, current CEO. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know the status in Indonesia right now. Oh, okay, I'm I'm an advisor. I talk at a high level, so I don't think that you know talking about Indonesia. All right, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, thank you. But thank yeah. you. I think we have time for probably about two more questions. Uh. -uh. Hi, I'm Young Min. Um, I just had a question about work environment and like employee happiness retention. Mm -hmm. um, so my friend worked at Kakao and she told me like you guys work on a like first name basis. There's no mm -hmm. like Teddy or Kwa Dang, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. kind of like hierarchy. Right. And I was wondering like how that affected work culture environment, uh, employee happiness retention and how that kind of contradicts or not contradicts but is different from other korean companies mm -hmm. where it's very hierarchical and there's right. like a so i was just wondering your thoughts on that um great question um we are pretty proud of using it's weird but we had uh, you know english names when i was in korea i was called jimmy now here i'm called jihun <laughs> so that's the irony um one thing about having um 
English name in Korea is because the people who lived in Korea would know. It, mostly in typical Korean organizations, you call like Im Ji Hun Te Pyon Nim. You know, like you, you always put the title in the back and then you, you have the full name. And those kind of communications um, hinders, you know, uh, the, the communication flow. And which makes worse is that, you know, you have the different languages, right? Some respectful language that you speak to your higher person or older person, and you have, you know, the common language, right? So those kind of things um, makes the work very inefficient. So we took all those off and we said that you have to call from the first name, first name basis, nothing attached, and then everybody has to speak, you know, uh, it has to be one way, one, one language, not, not, you know, like um, mixing up because um, if you have those, if you have those separate things, um, you're, you're bringing in more complexity because if you're younger, if you're, you know, lower ranked, it's much more difficult, harder for you to speak out. But the beauty of having working together, and especially when it comes to the internet companies, is that those people are the most precious people who actually develop the apps. And, you know, they, they, they are most insightful and they, they, you know, resonate with the users. So they really have to speak out. So those kind of tactics and tools were pretty helpful. Um, it's not very easy to uh, implement if you think about it because it's weird, you know, in Korea, a bunch of Koreans, you know, calling it's a very English name. It's a very patriarchal society too. And so right. you have this hierarchy that is has been around for 5,000 years. Right. And, every, and so that must have been a big culture change mm -hmm. for especially having a young CEO coming right. in. So I can't say that Kakao is perfect because... We also inherited that Korean culture, but we did, we put a lot of effort to, you know, um, enable the things that I just said. But yeah, one of the things that I don't really like about Korea, even though I'm Korean, I'm proud of Korea, is that this language system and this ageism or age culture, I don't really get it. Like you're, you're only like one year older than I am. And then I suddenly I have to speak different language to you and you are kind of, you know, ordering me around. I hate that. Um, 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 it's, it's, it's BS, I think. <laughs> um, right. And, and when it comes to the company, uh, standpoint, think that you, you are promoting somebody, let's say you're bringing in another standard. All the companies or organization has to be based on, has to be operated based on meritocracy, right? If you are competent, you have to have the role. You have to get the opportunity. You have to get promoted if you have accomplished something. But once you have the age, and which makes even worse if, if those people are kind of, you know, came from the same college and they call Sombei or Hubei, it gets very uh, complicated and you promote the younger person. Sometimes, you know, the older person kind of, leaves the company even or requests a change of department. So those kind of things um, makes Korea society very inefficient. And I really hope that this will, you know, change, change a little <laughs> bit more than that. I really want to remove those kind of things. Um, um, well, as the younger see. generation comes to of age, such uh -huh. as like people like you and, and changing the culture from within, that is something that will hopefully I wish change. so. I wish so. But um, what I'm encountering is that it's not very easy because we still are having the same thing. Yeah. I hear that, you know, uh, kindergarten students, like the first thing that they, 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 when they meet is like, how old are you? Mm -hmm. And then... If you're older, you, you use the common language. If you're younger, you use the respectful language. And right. I think it's nonsense. Well, I mean, even with twins, right? If you were born a couple hours earlier, you're on the and oppa. And, it's you crazy. Know, yeah. <laughs> um, I think last question. Is there in the front of the room? Hi. Uh, oh. Thank you for your time. Um, I had a question about uh, management. And tonight in your talk, it really touched me when you said uh, when you were having um, when you first came into Kakao and the company was having a hardship you had to really be on the leadership role and then you know take out all the obstacles and really empower your employees so I guess I want to get some tips or specific examples that you did to empower all the employees to head into one direction 
Um, again, saying that uh, if you really think about what a leader does, I think, especially when it comes to CEO, we are having, uh, we're fantasizing CEOs, I think, especially be because of the media. You're seeing superstar CEOs, celebrity CEOs, and like they are directing all products, defining all products. But if, if, it's, if, if that's really happening, that company should be extremely inefficient. Think about all the people in the middle. Um, could they really work well? So a, a leader really has to, you know, uh, keep the mission critical uh, decisions. And those are the things that uh, he or she has to deal with. And other than that, you have to maximize the team performance, right? And in a lot of cases, they're going to be better in those areas because they're the people who are working 24-7 on that area, right? So um, it's not like empowering, empowering, empowering. It's that you have to make them valuable. Um, and if you really think about it, um, you don't even listen to your own parents, right? And if you think that by directing and ordering people that you'll get a better result, I doubt it. You really have to make feel you have to make them feel that they're really owning the decision. So sometimes, even though you're making a decision, you you don't explicitly show it. That's like a small tactic that. Actually, you're pulling some strings, but it's an invisible string. They feel like they're making all the decisions. But sometimes when you see that it's not going to the direction that you want, then you slightly you know, uh, pull the string and say that, have you ever thought about this way? Right? Rather than saying that you do A, B, C uh, up to next week, bring it. And then they'll just do up to that level. There's no reason for them to do more. Right, but if you slightly change the method and you know question a lot, and have you ever thought about this way? Does this make sense? What about you know you think about it? Let's talk it next week. Then that person is really doing it, even though you know that you want to go that direction. So these kind of um, um, thing, empowering, right? Yeah, to, yeah, it's not it's not doing something for them. It's doing something for you, right? Because if you don't make them perform, outperform, you you you'll not you know uh, get the result. Thanks to them, at the end of the day, actually, th that's the reason I was, you know, saying many times that I really thank my colleagues is thanks to all of them, I'm getting all the credit, I'm getting, you know, um, um, praised, right? I get like CEO awards. But if you really think about it, those were the people who really worked hard. That doesn't mean that I didn't work hard, but, you know, it's a different, it's a different way, right? It's a different work. So um, we're all human. So... Even though you're a student, you do a group assignment, you know, you know, oh, this, this person, this, this guy is, isn't really working, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get a little bit pissed. And then you, you also don't do your best, right? That's human. It, it's same, the same thing applies in, in company. So you have to, you know, make them bring their best of, the, of themselves. That's the key point of leadership, I believe. All right. Great questions, really is it, amazing. Is it already uh, an hour and 30? Yeah, I well, flew by, right? We have uh, about just enough time for mm -hmm. some parting words of wisdom uh -huh. from you. Is there uh -huh. anything that we didn't cover tonight that you would mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. to impart to our audience members? Mm -hmm. um, there were some comments that I, it might sound a little bit negative, especially for example, like startups. Um, that was, on purpose, on, on purpose. Um, but go, going back to like my general advice uh, would be: there are so many things that we contemplate on, think about it, and you know, measure it. But I would like you to just do it. Why not try? One, one thing, one of my attitude that I kind of like of myself is that why not try? Right. For example. Um, you know, even for myself, when I was offered the uh, CEO job of Kakao, if you really think about it, I was a venture capitalist. I've never ran a huge company that had like 5,000 employees. But I was like, why not try? Um, if I do my best, it might work. Um, even, you know, teaching at Stern, NYU, 
um, when I first got the offer, I was a little bit afraid, honestly speaking, because I don't have an MBA um, and I'm teaching MBA students. I was never educated in the States. Um, I heard that students here are very passionate, aggressive sometimes. So I was like, <laughs> wait, what if they don't value my experience from Korea? I was a little bit afraid, but I was like, okay, why not try? You know, like it's a good way to learn academia system here and also uh, U.S., as I said. So all, all these kind of things, if you really think about it, you don't lose that much. What are you re really losing uh, by trying something? Even though you fail, especially in your early careers, is that like a huge failure? Not really. Most of the things that you're contemplating and thinking about, like, should I, shall I do it or not? Just do it. Even though you don't succeed, you're not going to lose that much. Is it that risky? I doubt it. There are not that many risky things that you can't really turn around. And for example, um, you know, um, there were other related to this. Um, for example, you know, some people were asking me, how, how did you quit the Boston Consulting Group and go to like a venture capital when venture capital was not a popular job in South Korea? At that time, 2007 in Korea, VC was not popular. So a lot of people were saying, that, why don't you just stick to BCG? I was like, okay, why not try? And if I, if I figure it out that, you know, VC is not a thing that I would like to do, I could come back. Hmm. The only thing I lose is like one year. Maybe I'll get promoted a year later. Is that a big thing? Not really, right? So I didn't, I never really felt the pressure that um, I might be deciding something wrong. So, so having that kind of, you know, attitude really helped me out, I think. Well, you've certainly had enough jobs and lived so many <laughs> lifetimes. Jumped around, yeah, right? and, and you're still so young that you could have a whole many other careers as well. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It really was very enlightening, and uh, you make me want to go out and try something tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being a great audience and for all of your wonderful questions. Thank you.